Welcome back to day six of the 2024 advent of code. So today's another grid problem. We have a guard controlling part of the lab and we're trying to work out where the guard will go. So we get a map as our puzzle input where we have the guard notated by the caret indicating that the guard is currently facing north and any obstructions are shown as pound signs. The guards here follow a very strict protocol if the space in front of them is clear, they step forward, otherwise they turn right 90 degrees. And so here's an example, the guard walks forward, hits this obstacle, turns right, walks into this obstacle, then walks down here, walks here, walks here, 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 here. And after reaching this space here, the guard will proceed to walk off the bottom of the screen and leave the lab. And so we want to predict the guard's route. And so including the starting position, we want to figure out how many distinct positions the guard will visit before leaving the lab. So let's get right into this problem. Our input is going to be a grid. So let's do grid equals the entire input split over new lines. And now that we have our grid, we want to identify where the guard currently is. So we're going to use row and column coordinates. I prefer using R and C over X and Y because it avoids confusion. So for R in range length grid, for C in range, let's extract these variables. Uh, the rows is gonna be the length of the grid and calls is going to be length of the first row. So we can say for R in range rows and for C in range calls, we can say if grid RC equals the caret, then we have our position. So we can assign these as separate variables, gr and gc, and then we can break. You can alternatively just break here because in Python, uh, loop variables will bleed into the surrounding scope, which means that we can still access the last value that r and c had here. Now, this is not actually going to be correct because this break only breaks this statement, as we want to have some way to break out of both. One way you can do this is define a function and immediately call it and replace this break with a return. But another way you can skip upwards in loops is to add this construction here, which I find to often be useful. So let me quickly explain what this does. I have a YouTube short covering this topic in a bit more depth, but essentially else when attached to a for loop will run if the for loop does not break. Break skips the entire structure meaning that it will exit past the else block and move on to this line. Essentially, if we do not break, i.e. we do not find what we're looking for, then the else block will run. What this has the effect of doing is that if the for loop runs without breaking and goes through each column, then we will hit the else block and continue on to the next iteration, as usual. If we do break out of the inner for loop, then the else block that continues past the break is skipped, meaning this break triggers this break and exits the outer loop as well. Essentially, you can chain else continue break on a for loop to make it so that break inside of that for loop will also break the outer for loop. I would not recommend stacking this past one usage because then it starts to get messy. If you're nesting more than two for loops, you should probably consider using a function for clarity, or you may want to reconsider your structure. Anyway, now that gives us the proper coordinates for the starting position of the guard. The guard is currently moving upwards, and so we want the guard's direction. Since the guard is moving up, they are moving, they are decreasing their row by one each step and changing their column by nothing. We will represent these in the variables dr and dc. In order to determine how many unique positions the guard has visited, we will maintain a set of positions that we've seen the guard in. This will initially start as r and c. Note that sets cannot have duplicate elements, meaning that if we try to add the same element into the set, it will instead not modify it, meaning at the end, our answer will just be the number of elements that are in the scene set. So now let's solve this problem. We're going to run a while true loop, and we're going to keep going until the guard's next position is invalid, meaning that the guard would exit. What we can do here is we can do scene.add rc and what we could also technically do here is get rid of this and just make scene start as an empty set it would not really make a difference now what we do is we check if the guard is about to step out of the lab 
So we can say if C in, if R plus DR is out of range, which we say is less than zero or greater than or equal to the number of rows, or the column is out of range, which is also less than zero or greater than or equal to the number of columns, that means that the guard is about to step out of position. And so in this case, we can simply break out of the loop. Once the guard is about to leave the lab, the next step will step outside of the mapped region. And so we can stop considering after that. Otherwise, we want to check what position the guard is about to walk into. So that would be coordinate R plus DR, C plus DC. We have two conditions, either this is an obstacle or not. We don't want to check for the dot because remember we still have that caret in the grid. There's no point removing it, so we can just say if the grid position is equal to a pound sign, then the guard is about to walk into an obstruction. Instead of walking into the obstruction, the guard will turn right. How can we turn the guard right? Well, if we represent dr and dc in a pair, we can see that this relation is actually really easy to represent. These are our directions. And we can see that each time we want to turn right or rotate clockwise, we are essentially swapping which one of these is non-zero. And when we're in this side, the sign will swap, but when we're on this side, the sign will not. Essentially, we are moving dr to dc, and when this happens, it becomes negative. And we are also moving dc to dr, but this side is not negative. Essentially, the new DC becomes the old DR but negative, and DR becomes DC. Now, if we were to write these two statements in two lines, this would not work because after DC is modified, that would inform this variable. So what we can instead do in Python is simply assign the two variables at the same time. So DC becomes negative DR, and DR becomes DC. So this happens in parallel, meaning that these assignments are done at the same time, and the new values do not update these values. The way you can imagine this working is that Python is taking the right side, bundling it into a pair, and then expanding out the pair and assigning it to the left side afterwards. And so when these variables are changing, it does not influence the pair itself. If the guard is not about to walk into a wall, then we can just step forward. So R changes by DR, C changes by DC, and when the guard's position moves, it will be tracked by the scene set here. And this gives us the answer for part one. Moving on to part two, we are informed that the patrol area is too large for the historians to, sorry, for the, whoever is infiltrating the lab to search the lab without getting caught. And we're pretty sure adding an obstruction won't cause a paradox. And so essentially what we want to do is get the guard stuck in a loop. I am not exactly sure why this would be helpful instead of just waiting for the guard to, you know, leave the lab. But let's suppose that this makes sense. So essentially we're looking for every position we can stick an object that will block the guard's path and cause the guard to enter a loop. And so here are some examples. It doesn't really matter what we choose to use as an obstacle, and we want to have enough options so we can minimize the possibility of a time paradox, so we want to know how many positions we can choose for this obstruction. Now the solution I'm going to go over is a brute force, as that's the most straightforward solution, but I haven't put much time into thinking about more efficient solutions yet. The solution will take a couple of seconds to run, but I will look into other more optimized solutions, and if I can find something, I may make a video about it covering this uh, challenge again in the future. What we can do is we can extend our logic that we currently have, and we can build on it. So let's define a function that determines whether or not the guard will loop, and it'll accept a grid, and it'll take the start position. The reason we take the start position as a function parameter is so that we can pass in the global R and C each time. 
and these parameters when modified here will not influence the global scope. This essentially avoids us needing to reset R and C. In order to determine if the guard is in a loop, we need to track more than just the row and column position. Instead, we also need to track the current direction. The guard may cross their own path, but moving in a different direction, and that does not necessarily indicate a loop. But because the guard's path is step by step and only based on the current position and direction, if the guard ever ends up in the same position with the same direction, then we know that they have entered a loop and will be stuck there forever. The way we can check this is at the end of this loop, after we have made our turn or our movement, it does not matter which, if the new position and direction are already seen, then we know that we have found a loop. If the guard is about to step outside of the lab, that means that we have failed to force them into a loop, and so we return false. This loop only exits with a return false if the guard will exit the grid, or a return true if we find that the guard is in a loop, and so we don't need anything after the while loop. Now let's basically just brute force every possibility. We require that the spot is currently blank, because one caveat that was noted here is that we cannot place an obstruction on top of the guard's starting position as they would immediately notice. We also cannot place an obstruction where there already is one as that would not change the outcome. So we need the spot to be blank. So we'll skip any case where it isn't blank. And if it is, what we can do here is we can simply modify the grid. This is a bit easier than cloning the grid. And then we can say if this induces a loop, we will increase our count by one. At the end, we need to make sure we set the grid back, otherwise our obstructions would pile up, and we need to make sure we're only adding one single obstruction. Then we can simply print out the count, or, oh, yeah, I made a bit of a mistake here. Uh, these variables are getting shadowed by these, so we're losing the context here. Uh, let's call this change row and change column. Okay, so CR and CC are the coordinates of the change we're making. We need that position to currently be blank, and we'll set it to an obstruction, test it, and then set it back. This lets us keep R and C from earlier above. This is why I should pick better variable names, but... Anyway, if we let that run for a bit, it's going to take a couple of seconds, we should get our answer for part two. And we can see that this indeed did produce a solution. Note that it does take a bit of time, but one thing about the advent of code is it matters how fast you get to your answer. It does not matter how fast your solution is. If writing a solution that took one minute less to run would take you five minutes, then it's not really worth the time trade-off when you're actually going for a leaderboard position. Now, granted, writing efficient solutions is always a nice secondary challenge to have, and I do encourage you to look for more optimized methods or find some way to optimize the challenge yourself that targets a different goal than just going for solving time. I think that's a great opportunity to use the advent of code to learn new things and develop skills outside of just solve a problem fast. And so that is something that I will do shortly after uploading this video. In any case, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time.